join me in prayer, please? God, we ask that you would, at this moment in time, uh, slow us down a bit. Um, we ask that you, at this moment in time, would, would quiet all the other noise that we maybe have brought in uh, into this space with us this morning. I pray that you would, you, would, you would calm our spirits, not because we want to merely meditate, but rather because we want to meditate on you and we want to meditate on your word. Um, we have come into this room today um, deeply marked and shaped by the ways of the world, the thought process of the world, the system of the world that we live in. That's just normal. But we've, we've come here today that you might, you might recalibrate our thoughts. You might change our thoughts so that we are, we're, we're in line with your system and, 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 and your values. That, that, that what we love uh, might line up with what you love, God. And so, so again, I, I pray that you would quiet the noise in our lives for this hour and you would, you would speak into our lives, Lord. Holy Spirit, we, we invite you here. You're, you're, of course, you're welcome here. You go where you please, but we invite you, we welcome you in the sense that we don't want to miss your power and your presence your voice in our lives today. If you would, would speak and, and we would listen and we would be changed according to your will, then, then we feel like um, what we've come here uh, for today will have been accomplished. So pray that you would do that. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. With the birth of every child here at River Church, and we've had, we've had several in the last 12 to 18 months. We've had, we had several children born. The, the, with the birth of every child comes uh, the, the, this, this topic, this discussion of baptism comes up. And today's not, a, today's not a message on baptism, but it's relevant to kind of the starting point of our, of our message today. So with with, with every, in fact, in, just in the last few weeks, someone recently had a baby, and like, what do we, what do we think on baptism? What do we believe on baptism? You know, should I get my kid baptized? And, I, and, and you know, that, that discussion, especially down here, down here in the valley, where many of us uh, grew up Catholic. I, I didn't, but where many of us grew up Catholic, and uh, maybe you were baptized as a baby, and uh, you know, so, so a lot of questions, especially when you have a baby, like, gosh, what, 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 what's the response? I love my child. What's the responsible thing to do? And so you, you know, for the, for the sake of this conversation, there are like two different categories. There are other categories regarding the baptism, but, but, but we'll leave it at this for today. There's this pedo baptism, which is, the, which is child, that, that, the pedo Latin referencing child. So, so there's pedo baptism, which is uh, what many of you experienced, perhaps you were baptized as a baby, and then there's credo, credo baptism, which is a big fancy word for believers' baptism, which that that's what I experienced. That's what we practice here at River Church. You you are baptized um, after you you speak a creed, or you not literally a creed, but you 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 speak your belief in Jesus. You put your faith and your trust. In Jesus, and then you are uh, you're baptized as a as a sign, as a symbol of I have I have died to my old ways, and now I am going to live with Christ as my my master, my boss, my Lord, the captain of my ship. So I'm dying to my old ways, and I'm going to now live a new life in Christ. And so there's 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 pedo baptism. I love how they sort of rhyme, and there's credo baptism. And so if I, um, you know, if I asked you, you parents, uh, regardless if you have a baby, uh, you know, if you're a parent, if I said like, you know, you love your children dearly. And uh, when you, when you 
if, you, if we did practice, if we did ba- baptize babies here, you, know, you bring your baby up here, and, and what, what's, what is really going on? Who is really at that moment in time making a commitment? And I think probably everyone in the world would say that, that the parents are making a commitment at that moment in time. And again, this is not a sermon on baptism, and it's not, I'm not here to, to speak against pedo baptism today. My, my point, by the way, a brief tangent. In January, in the, in, in the beginning of, of 2022, Pastor Billy and I have talked, and we're going to do uh, a, a service that will be a, a baby dedication service in which parents can commit, can dedicate. We're going to spend the next 18 years, yay, the rest of our lives, leading and feeding and protecting this child that he or she might one day make a faith commitment to Jesus. So we're going to, we're going to do that. Okay, back to the point today. Um, in Jesus' day, in Jesus' day, a good Jewish family would take their baby to the temple and they would, they would dedicate their baby at a certain age. It's just what, what good Jewish families did. Now think on this. I know you know this, but, but, but think, uh, think about the, the implications of this. With, within all of Palestine, Israel, but all of Palestine, there was... Uh, there was one temple. So if you're, if you're Jewish, never mind that you might have dispersed, you might live in some other, in Asia Minor or somewhere else, but, but if, you just, if, if, you live in, if you live within Palestine and you, uh, you have a baby, then you have to get yourself, your family, and your baby all the way to Jerusalem, to the temple, because there's only one for the whole nation, and, and dedicate your baby. Just a matter of perspective, in that day, Palestine, the, in the country, there were five or 600,000 people, so relatively small. I mean, smaller than the valley. But nonetheless, it might be like if we were here in the valley and we had to go to one place in San Benito or whatever to, to dedicate our baby. That was like the one, that was the temple, and we had to go there. Um, so that's what they did. Uh, in, in, in Jerusalem itself, there were probably, uh, I, think there were, uh, I think there were 50 or 60,000 people that lived in Jerusalem, um, except during the, the, the festivals when several hundred thousand people would converge on Jerusalem. So, so Jesus is born in that era, into that tradition Today's story is the, 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 the tradition that I just spoke, off, spoke of is the jumping off point of today's story. Um, and we've got four, four characters in today's story. We've got, we've got baby Jesus. We've got Mary and Joseph, the mother and the, adopted, the adoptive uh, dad of baby Jesus. And then we have a character that you may not be real familiar with. His name is Simeon. And we, what we know is that, that Simeon, according to Luke, the Gospel of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, the third gospel in the Bible, in the New Testament, um, what we know from Luke is that, that Simeon was a pious Jewish man, a, a righteous Jewish man, who was promised that he would not die before he saw the Messiah, the baby Jesus, Emmanuel. So that's the story, and with that as the backdrop, let's read. Luke chapter 2. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him that's, that's baby Jesus. They brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Parenthetically, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb, the firstborn, shall be called holy to the Lord. 
So, so they, they, they brought him to present him to the Lord. Verse 24, and, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. And what is said in the law of the Lord? It's said that the sacrifice should be, and then Luke says, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. That's really significant. We're going to come back to that. Why did Luke use those, those words? A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Verse 25. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout. And he was, catch these words, waiting for the consolation, could be comfort, for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And that's a very unique phrase. That's not, that's not how everyone is described, especially in the Old Testament. But the, the Holy Spirit was, on, was upon him. Verse 26, and it had been revealed to Simeon by the Holy Spirit, here's what I was talking about, that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. He was led by the Spirit into the temple. And, and when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him according to the custom of the law, verse 28, Simeon took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for your glory and, and for glory to your people Israel. And, and having said that, verse 33 and his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him, about Jesus. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, catch this, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. And for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, Mary. So that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Okay, there's, there's so much here. Um, I've, had to, I've had to choose what, what to really drill down deep on because there are things that we just don't have time for today. There's so much here. Every phrase, um, let's pick up from the beginning and just, just, just look more closely at a few of them. The, the first phrase in the very first verse that we read, it says, when the time came. Actually, in, uh, in verse 22, it says, and when the time came, and then it tells what that time was. When the time came. Now, now that's significant, chosen. Those words are significant, and they're, they're chosen by Luke. They're spoken or written by Luke. What he's talking about is that time that's coming is this 40-day this period after Jesus' birth. Uh, they had about 40 days to get to the temple. Maybe they're living in Galilee, quite a distance away. Maybe they're in Bethlehem. They, they don't have that far to go, but they've got 40 days to make their way to the temple to dedicate this baby. 40 days after Jesus' birth. So, so that seven days after Jesus' birth or after any Jewish boy's birth would have come circumcision. And then 33 days after circumcision was purification and dedication. And they were to offer a sacrifice to the Lord in the temple. And, and the author of, 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 this, of this gospel, Luke, 
he, he, he mentions specifically, he says in verse 24, that, that their sacrifice was, remember what it was? A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. That's, that's what he says. But he leaves something out. I don't expect you to know what I mean by that, but, but I'm, I'm going to tell you. He leaves something out. You see, a good Jewish family, when they came to, for, for this time of purification for the mom and the dedication of the baby, they, there was a sacrifice that was prescribed. It had been commanded or determined hundreds of years ago prior to this event in the Old Testament. And, and, and it, again, Luke leaves something out. Let's see what Leviticus 12 says. It says this, and when the days of her purifying are completed, this was written long ago, when her days of, of purifying are completed, whether for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting a lamb, a year old for a burnt offering, and a pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. Okay, so really what Mary and Joseph were supposed to bring was more than what they brought. However, it was acceptable. What they brought was acceptable given the fact that they were very poor. Mary and Joseph were very poor. Jesus was born into a very meager, simple family. I, I was just thinking last night, like, I was thinking, what, in my own context, who might I know whom I would say, like, maybe I wouldn't say it, but I would think, yeah, Jesus probably wouldn't be born in that family because, you know, they wouldn't have money to take care of him or he wouldn't have a car to get him around. Or, you know, and, then, and then I thought, that's precisely the family that Jesus would have been born into. Because he was. Going on, it says that, verse 8, this is, again, Leviticus, written a long time ago. And if she cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons. See what's going on here? One for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for her, and she shall be clean. So the book of Leviticus, the Old Testament rites and rituals and commands and rules and regulations, they, they took into account the fact that there, there, there are going to be some families who can't afford a lamb um, sacrifice during this time of purification and dedication. And in their case, there'd be an exception and that's precisely what Luke is pointing out here in, in, this, in this passage when he says, they came to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. He's, giving, he's, 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 he's creatively giving us this account that they, they fell into this category. Luke, um, um, Mary and Joseph fell into this category where they didn't have to bring a lamb. They, they brought either, either two turtle doves or two young pigeons because uh, they, there was this clause that said, in this case, um, clearly you're, you're, you're poor to the degree that you cannot bring a lamb. Many years ago, uh, not that many, but uh, a number of years ago when Lydia and I, we, we had fewer kids, we were young and we were, we were, uh, we were leading a church. Or we were, I was the associate pastor at a church in, uh, in Albuquerque. It was downtown, city on a hill, urban. We met in, uh, we, we met in, a, in a, an old historic theater. And we would do this. There was this, this, this uh, like, like shop crawl, uh, like Christmas, uh, Christmas uh, they, would, they, would, they would, I don't know how to explain it. They would shut down the street because it was urban. And all the shops would be open and give a chocolate, hot chocolate and do your shopping. It was really quaint, really fun. And so we, the church, we would try and do something to engage the community. And we would we put this parked car outside of the church with the hood up, you know, held up with a two-by-four. And, uh, and a, a lady all uh, sitting outside of the car, all bundled up with a little, with a little baby. 
and then the, the husband uh, standing guard over her. And of course, I guess you get, I guess you get the idea. That was, that was supposed to be a modern day context of Mary and Joseph. And some people were appalled that we would make Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus, you know, out to be a poor family with a broke down car. But that's actually quite an accurate depiction. When the time came, 40 days after Jesus' birth, they brought a pair of turtle doves and two or, or two young pigeons. You see, Mary and Joseph um, had not yet been visited by the, the wise men or the magi from the east. It's safe to believe that when the magi brought those gifts, that that's actually what funded Mary and Joseph's flight, not literally, but flight to Egypt later on. But at this point, they still have, they're, they're not a people of means by, by any means. Okay, so Simeon, Simeon. We don't know much about Simeon. Let me, let me um, suggest that the fact that we don't know much about Simeon is on purpose. I mean, in fact, everything in the Bible is on purpose, right? Um, Tim, Tim Keller, Pastor Tim Keller likes to say that, that, we, that the Bible gives us information on an as-needed basis. As, uh, as we need to know something, the Bible gives it. The Bible doesn't give us something. We just, you know, is there life on Mars? Well, we don't need to know that. The Bible didn't tell us that. Anyway, so um, we don't know much about Simeon. So, so we're just going to talk about what we do know, but we don't know that much about Simeon. He, um, he, was, he was perhaps an older man because he seems to be contemplating a death, right? Uh, he's, he's, got some, he's got some wear on the tires. I think that's safe to say. Uh, other than that, we, we, we know little about him. Luke found, the, the gospel writer, Luke found his total identity to be unimportant. So he didn't give us his total identity. So we work with what we have. There is, I'll say this, there is no reason to believe, some speculate, there is no reason to believe that he was a religious leader, like he worked at the temple. There's really, there's really no evidence of that. I mean, I guess it could be the case, but there was no, no evidence of that. What we do know, though, is that it says he was righteous, he was devout, And he was waiting on the consolation, paraklesin is the word. He was waiting on the consolation of Israel. And, and that, that's kind of a hard word for us to digest. What is that? The consolation of Israel. Well, it refers to the comfort that the Jesus or that the Messiah was to bring to the nation of Israel there. They're beaten down. They're, 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 they've, been, they've been overtaken by Rome. They have no real autonomy as a nation. I don't, by the way, think that's their biggest problem. I think their biggest problem lies in their, their spiritual state. They've, they've tried this temple thing. They've tried this following the law, following this rule thing. They continue to fail. They, they continue to... To, to, to let themselves down and to let God down. They, 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 they've gone through, through several periods, the nation of Israel, of being taken into captivity because they've been so rebellious and so disobedient to the Lord. Now they're back in Palestine again, and they're just a beat-down people. And what they've been promised is that the, the, that the Messiah will come and that the Messiah will make all things new, will make all things things right. And so, so the, the passage says that Simeon is waiting on the consolation or the comfort of Israel. Jesus brings comfort. And then, and then Simeon makes a somewhat controversial statement regarding this comfort that Christ brings. I read it. I'll unpack that here in a little bit. He makes a somewhat controversial statement. Now, 
the passage in verse 25 and verse 27, it says that the Holy Spirit was on Simeon. Why does Luke say that? Luke says that because he wants us to understand, hey, the, this is a reliable testimony. What Simeon is going to say here, I, what he said, Luke records, and he wants us to understand, hey, this isn't just Simeon speculating. This is the, the God-breathed words coming out of Simeon's mouth, but they came through this Holy Spirit utterance. And so Luke tells us that by saying that the Holy Spirit was, was on Simeon and that the Holy Spirit led Simeon to, to the temple. So the Holy Spirit had revealed to Simeon that clearly at an earlier time that Simeon would not see death until he laid eyes on the physical, incarnate baby Jesus, the Messiah. So Simeon's life was a life of waiting. Maybe you can relate to that. Maybe you feel like you just your life has just been a life of, 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 of waiting in some sort. And so Simeon's life was a life of, of waiting. And so... The day finally comes, and upon laying eyes on the Messiah, on the Christ child, and, and, and even getting to, to hold baby Jesus in his arms. I don't know. I, 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 would, I wish I could see, like, the actual, that play out. I mean, you know how protective mamas are of their little baby, especially in that first month or two, but somehow... Mary was okay with it, and, 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 and Simeon got to hold baby Jesus. And then he begins this, this prophetic, poetic song we, we've talked about. This is the fourth of these songs in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we, 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 we've looked at, at three others. We looked at, at Mary's song. We looked at the song of... Uh, Zechariah, the, the father of John the Baptist. We, look at, we looked at, uh, at the angels' song that they sang to the shepherds last week. And now this is the fourth song or prophetic utterance that we have in these first two chapters of Luke. And so in his song, in his prophetic utterance that he speaks over baby Jesus, he makes three really significant statements. The first is that Jesus brings salvation, and that salvation, there should be a comma there, that salvation is spiritual in nature. He says this baby, is, 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 he's, he's, he's brought salvation. And, and as you may know, many, many of the Jews of that day were expecting him to bring political salvation. And Jesus, the position Jesus took was, I'll be your king, but not that kind of king. Jesus brings salvation, and it's spiritual in nature. I think it's worth us talking just a little bit about what is saving faith. We've got a next. Saving faith. This is Wayne Grudem's uh, definition of saving faith. I, I put this up here because I, I want to push you, prod you a bit to say, are you a person of faith? And I'm a person of faith. We have people, we have politicians all the time. I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, position of, I'm a person of faith. And, and so, so here is, based on the scriptures, here is um, Wayne, Wayne Grudem's, uh, Dr., Dr. Wayne Grudem, Pastor Wayne Grudem's uh, definition of saving faith. According to scripture, it is trust in Jesus Christ as a living person for forgiveness of sins and for eternal life with God. When you when you you trust in this 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 God man Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and for the, your eternal life, that is saving faith. Jesus, number one, brings salvation. Second second big idea that that Simeon spoke in his song is this Jesus salvation has a universal dimension. Simeon is the first person in the New Testament really to, 
to uh, it may have been it may have been uh, may have been Mary, but but in a, at a deeper level, Simeon is the first person in the New Testament to realize this this Messiah. He is not only going to rock our nation. He is going to shape and impact all the peoples of the world. I continue, I continue to be so fascinated by the fact that, that, that no other human being that has ever walked the earth, and of course as people of faith, we believe Jesus to be the God-man. But for those who aren't people of faith, who maybe that's you, maybe there are, maybe there are a few people here today who are still, still skeptics, um, even if you just see Jesus as a man, it is hard to deny the fact that Jesus has shaped and impacted history like no other human being that has ever lived. And yet Jesus never wrote a book. He has shaped and impacted world history. I mean, we've got, we've got B.C. and then in A.D., our, our very calendar is marked by the Messiah's coming to this world. Jesus' salvation has a universal dimension. And number three, this is the part that, that I think is somewhat controversial. Simeon, in that day, he's looking at this baby, and he says of this baby, and his parents, didn't, the baby's parents didn't know what to do with this. They were astounded. Um, they, 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 they marveled when he said this. They were, their, their, their breaths were taken away. He says that many will be esteemed because of this child, and many will be laid low on account of this child. This child is appointed for the fall and the rising of many in Israel. That's what he said in, in verse 34. And what does he mean by that? Many will fall and many will, will rise on the account of this child. There's a, there's a double significance to Jesus' life and ministry. And, and it, is so, it is so important, folks, that you get this right. It, it, is, it, is, it is of vital importance that you not miss this. There are two Outcomes. Two outcomes. And how you respond to Jesus determines the outcome. There, there, some will be laid low, meaning there will be this tragic end to their lives, and others will be lifted up on account of Jesus. Salvation for the humble and judgment for the haughty. That means the proud. In other words, Simeon is pointing out something that, 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 that much of Scripture points out, and that is Jesus is a fork in the road in your life. Jesus is a fork in the road in your life. When you are confronted with the gospel, you are compelled one direction, and that is a life of humble faith? Or you are compelled in another direction? A life of prideful, selfish disbelief. It, it's, it's, it, is, it is woven into the, the narrative of the birth of baby Jesus. We think we should wait and talk about that when we get to the cross, but Simeon brings it up right at the beginning. This baby, uh, because of this baby, many will be laid low, and many will be lifted up. Later on in Scripture, Paul the Apostle says the same thing. In Romans chapter 9, he says this. He says, God warned them. Go to Romans chapter 9. God warned them of this in Scripture when he said, I am placing a stone in Jerusalem. This is a symbol of Jesus. That makes people stumble. 
a rock that makes them fall. But anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jesus is a fork in the road in your life, and it is so important that you get this right. It's so, so important that you understand this. There is no middle ground with Jesus. I believe we also have passage. Oh, actually, let me go on. I didn't, I didn't finish. But any, go to the next slide. Okay, yeah. this is uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. It's really the same by a different, by a different author of the same thing. It says, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. It's actually quoting uh, Isaiah chapter 28 from the Old Testament. We need to embrace, we need to realize, even celebrate the fact that, that Scripture makes it clear. Jesus leads to a, a, a glorious end for some. May that be for all of us in this room. And a, and a tragic end for others. Yeah, the, the Scripture gives us no no space to live in this world where many want to live, which is Jesus was just a good man. There's no space for that if, 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 you embrace, if you embrace the Scriptures as being true. When we read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, when we read the Gospels, we, we find it so surprising that, that, that many of his own people, they rejected Jesus. How do they do that? How, how, do, how do they... How does the nation of Israel, they've been waiting on the Messiah, and the Messiah comes. And how, do they, how do they miss that? Well, Luke, already in chapter 2, at the beginning of the story, he is already telling us. He's, it's, it's early on, and he's already predicting this. And by the way, to this day, 2,000 years later, it is still true. We, 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 many of us, we, we still, t- maybe you in this room today, we still don't bend the knee in submission to Jesus' agenda. I would say it this way. Maybe you have an agenda in life, and so what we do is we live our own agenda, and we hope that Jesus, oh, Jesus, would you bless my agenda in life? And, and Jesus will have no part of that. The story of Jesus, and it begins with Mary's teaching that we looked at three weeks ago. The story of Jesus, it's divisive. Jesus is controversial. I used this, last, this word last week. I'll use it again. There is even a subversive nature to the gospel story. In other words, Jesus is subversive. The story of Jesus is subversive in the sense that it is intended to subvert, cancel out an established system, the world system, Sub- to, to subvert. It's kind of, a, kind of a big word. You don't necessarily run around using that word all that time, but, uh, all the time. But subvert means that you, you undermine the power of, the authority uh, of an established system. So historically, if you are subversive, if you're considered subversive by maybe the, the, the government, the agency that you live in, then they're going to they're gonna do you, they're going to they're going to they're going to rein you in because you're trying to undermine the power and the authority of an established system. Well, what is the assist, the established system that Jesus came to subvert? It, it's the world system in which we live. This, this, this system of, of self-preservation and self-centeredness and selfishness and self-worship. Jesus came to subvert, to, to bring an end to the system in which we live. And so if you are living like 
like everyone else around you, then it's safe to say that you're living in the world's system. And Jesus came to subvert that, to save you from that system. 